If you followed this channel for very long, then you know that I love talking about cut content in Pokemon games. Well, today we are going all in on that subject as we are going to be covering a whopping 50 cut features from various Pokemon games that would have changed everything had they actually been included. Due to the large number I'm covering today, I'm going to be doing this in a rapid fire style, and all of the features I am covering either come from data within the games themselves, leaks, or interviews where they were specified. Without any further ado though, let's go ahead and get into some crazy cut Pokemon features that would have changed everything. Okay, so we're going to be going in generational order, starting, of course, with Generation 1. Kicking us off at number 1 is the fact that badges, gym badges, were originally going to be items that were usable. The game's data tells us that they would have given you the ability to throw rocks or bait like you can do in the Safari Zone within the general overworld, but this is really all we know as it pertains to this cut feature. Another cut feature from Gen 1 is that originally, you were going to be fighting Pokemon yourself as the human player character, and you were going to do it with a whip. Whips were much more prevalent in the earlier development days of Pokemon, and they can still be seen as a leftover within the final game, as various trainer classes within Red and Blue still carry whips in the final product. In addition to badges originally being usable items, there were also originally going to be belts that were given out instead of badges. According to an interview that was translated by Did You Know Gaming, apparently trainers were originally going to have a rank of some kind, and this rank was going to be shown off as you progressed throughout the game with karate-like belts that were different colors which signified your trainer rank. Back before Pokemon was even known as Pokemon, it was known as Capsule Monsters, and during this phase of development, Legendary Pokemon, or what would become Legendary Pokemon, were very, very different, as you would have to basically dungeon crawl in order to find them. At this time, these Pokemon were known as Mirage Monsters, and it was said that it could take up to two hours to even be able to find and catch one of them, and some of them you might not even be able to encounter or catch at all. Here's one that I'm sure you've never ever heard before. There was originally going to be a battle with Professor Oak in the Gen 1 games. I know, very original and groundbreaking Pokemon content here on YouTube. Based on the levels of Professor Oak's Pokemon, it seems that he was going to be a super boss type of character that you would have got to battle after defeating the Elite Four and the Champion, similar to Red from the Gen 2 games which would be released a few years later. There's also an interesting bit of unused code in these games that when enabled will change the palette of the game to a rainbow setting whenever you're within Celadon City. This likely has something to do with the rainbow badge that you get in Celadon City and could have possibly been intended to activate once you earned the badge from Erika. There were also tons of Pokemon in this game during the earlier stages of development that evolved at different levels than what they do now, like seriously the list is super long. This was all probably a part of the balancing phase of development as they were testing the game and trying to figure out what worked for each individual Pokemon. There were also, at one point, different Pokémon that were set to appear on Route 1. In the final game, you can only find Pidgey and Rattata, but originally, it was intended to be able to find Clefairy, Spearow, Caterpie, and even Nidoran Female. You probably also know that Pokémon was originally going to be called Capsule Monsters. Well, the only real reason why this was changed is because they had a little bit of trouble trying to trademark and copyright the name Capsule Monsters, and that had to do with the inspiration for Pokémon in general, which was the Ultraman series and its Capsule Kaiju, which is basically the same thing as Pokémon in terms of concept and ultimately prompted the name change. During the Capsule Monsters era, there was also something known as a Charisma stat. This would be a thing tied to the player character and would be the thing that would persuade Pokemon to join your team instead of catching them like we do in the final game. 
It seems like there were also going to be hotels in the original concept for the game instead of Pokemon centers. According to this early Capsule Monster art, it showcases a hotel where a player would go to rest and recuperate both themselves and their Pokemon. This can be seen in the final game via the Celadon Hotel, but it's ultimately a useless location, meaning that this is probably a leftover from when hotels were more prominent. In another piece of Capsule Monsters artwork, you can also see a trainer putting their Pokemon into some sort of machine, seemingly to heal them up, but the interesting thing about this is that there's only four slots in this machine, instead of six like we see in the Pokemon Centers when you go to heal up your Pokemon there. This could possibly mean that at one point, you were only able to carry four Pokemon with you at a time, instead of six. There's also been a lot of rumors and speculation with the original Pokemon games concerning a possible cut female player character that appears on this strategy guide for the games. However, this was ultimately debunked by Ken Sugimori, stating that when he made this art, he simply wanted to showcase a trio of trainers and designed this female character specifically for this purpose. However, this character would ultimately end up becoming green from the Pokemon Adventures manga, would inspire Leaf from the Fire Red and Leaf Green remakes, and eventually would make her way into the games herself as a character in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. According to that aforementioned concept art, there was also a possibility of being able to buy Pokemon within the original concept and ideas of what became Pokemon. However, this is obviously not a thing in the final games, and the only possible remnant of it is the Pokemon that you can buy with coins from the game corner. There's also an interesting cut feature in Pokemon Yellow, as there is an unused type of Pokemon encounter in that game that only allows the player to run away. This, given the fact that it only exists in Yellow version, could be tied to a scenario at the beginning of the game where you were meant to go out and catch your own Pikachu instead of having Professor Oak give it to you like he does in the final game. Also found within some leaked source code for Pokemon Yellow is the fact that originally a lot more Pokemon were going to have their anime cries in the game instead of their game ones. However, this was obviously cut and probably due to the fact that the audio quality of these cries when converting them for the Game Boy ended up in them becoming extremely low quality, as you can tell with these cries for Bulbasaur, Squirtle, and Charmander. Now we're on to cut features from Generation 2, and first and foremost, we've got to talk about the skateboard. The skateboard was basically a form of fast travel in the game, much like the bicycle, that was planned for gold and silver, and it was not really planned as a replacement of the bike, it was planned as kind of its own separate thing, like the roller skates from Pokemon X and Y. However, this was ultimately canned. There are also some unused text strings within the data of the Gen 2 games that reveals that the honey mechanic that we saw debut in Diamond and Pearl was originally going to be in gold and silver instead. It was cut for some unknown reason, however, it's probably the reason why the headbutt mechanic was eventually included instead. There was also going to be a Safari Zone in Gold and Silver, as evidenced by this unused, unfinished map of Fuchsia City's Safari Zone, which ultimately didn't make the final game. However, the Safari Zone would eventually be included in the Heart Gold and Soul Silver remakes. Within one of Gold and Silver's many beta leaks was an interesting minigame that was found that was originally intended to be included in these titles. This minigame was featured on the title screen for Gold and Silver, and had Pikachu running along the title screen collecting musical notes. According to cut content website The Cutting Room Floor, which is where a lot of this stuff is documented, so big shout out to them, you were also originally going to be able to name your mom in this game, much like you can name yourself and your rival. There is also data within the Gen 2 games that reveals that Payday was originally going to be a field move, much like Cut, Strength, Surf, and Fly. What it would have done, though, is unknown. Within the data of the Gen 2 games is also an unused memory game that would have been playable within the game corner in Goldenrod City. 
Found within the various leaked demos of Gold and Silver are also a lot of unused items that were intended for the games as well, including some weird ones that were known as the Tickle Stick, the Proof of Adulthood, and the Ice Bikini. However, there were also some really interesting and fascinating ones, like the Heart and Poison Stones, that would have originally evolved Eevee into Espeon and Umbreon. There were even a couple of cut Pokeballs from the Gen 2 games, including one known as the Direct Ball, which eventually became the Level Ball, and the Night Ball, which eventually became the Dusk Ball that debuted in Generation 4. We also saw the introduction of weather in the Gen 2 games, and originally it was a lot more powerful than it is in the final games, as rain and harsh sunlight was originally going to give a 100% buff to water and fire type attacks, instead of just 50%, which would have made it kind of OP. As you may know, there were also plans for a much bigger Johto region in Gold and Silver that originally was based on the entirety of Japan instead of just the Kansai region like in the final game. This did result in a much more smaller version of Kanto being present within the title, but the region overall was much more massive and resulted in the cutting of a bunch of locations that we never saw in the final product. Much like that cut memory game I just mentioned, there was also a cut poker minigame that was found within one of the gold and silver beta leaks as well. This ultimately got cut for who knows why, but it wouldn't have lasted long even if it did make the final games, because as we know, any resemblance or any signs of gambling was eventually removed altogether from every Pokemon game, starting with Generation 5. Another minigame that was also found within these beta leaks for Gold and Silver was Picross. This was a precursor to the planned but then cancelled Pokemon Picross game that was also going to come out for the Game Boy Color. So not only did it get canned in Gold and Silver, it also got canned as its own entire game. Now we move on to Generation 3, and the first cut feature of Generation 3 that is pretty significant are Wild Double Battles. These eventually made their way into the series in later generations, but they were originally planned to feature in Gen 3 along with the introduction of Double Battles themselves. There is also evidence within the game that originally it might have not been intended for every Pokemon to have a special ability, because there is a text string within the game under the abilities header that says no special ability, meaning that maybe some Pokemon didn't originally have abilities, and abilities could have possibly been reserved for special Pokemon much like Mega Evolutions are or Gigantamax for. There is also unused data within the Gen 3 games for a move combining feature. Within Double Battles, it was apparently intended that you would be able to combine moves into one more powerful move, with the one example given being the combination of Ember and Gust into a move called Heat Wave, which eventually did get included in the games, just not as this combined move, which ultimately would have been pretty cool. Within Fire Red and Leaf Green, as well as Pokemon Emerald, is a location known as Altering Cave. This is a location that did make the final games, but it has a function that didn't, and that is that there was going to be various events tied to the Altering Cave that would be distributed that would allow you to catch various otherwise unobtainable Pokemon within this cave specifically. For unknown reasons, none of these Pokemon or events were ever distributed. Now we're on to Generation 4, and within Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, there was originally going to be a much bigger gender differences mechanic than we ultimately got in the final game. In the final game, there's a few Pokemon that have gender differences, but as was revealed in a leak of Pokemon Diamond and Pearl's beta, this was originally much more widespread, which probably would have changed every Pokemon generation going forward if it was intended for this to be that big of a feature. Another thing you've probably never ever heard about before ever is the fact that there is a cut event in Diamond and Pearl that would have allowed you to get Arceus. It's known as the Azure Flute event. It was cut for stupid reasons. I'm sure you heard about it before, but it's still pretty interesting. 
Another interesting thing is that the female player character from Pokemon Crystal, Chris, was originally seemingly going to be the female player character in Heart Gold and Soul Silver. She was inexplicably replaced by Lyra in the final game, but there is an unused map icon of Chris's head within the data of Heart Gold and Soul Silver, which suggests that she was originally intended to appear. Tied to that cut Arceus Azure Flute event is actually another event because within Heart Gold and Soul Silver, it is actually possible to return to the Sinjo Ruins a second time and get another one of the Creation Trio. This would be done by bringing the Azure Flute Arceus to the Ruins of Alf as opposed to the event Arceus which was ultimately released which would have granted you a second trip. Now we get into Gen 5, and believe it or not, a feature that ultimately became Pokemon Ami was originally planned for Black and White, as revealed by Junichi Masuda in an interview with Game Informer. Also revealed in interviews is the fact that the key system for Pokemon Black and White 2 that eventually allowed you to unlock the difficulty setting was originally planned for Pokemon Black and White. It was not able to be put in for whatever reason, however, and that is the reason why we got two games as a part of the enhanced release for Gen 5 as opposed to the standard one like we had in past generations. Gen 5 also had a cut event of its own as well, and that was the Lock Capsule event. The Lock Capsule was an item that was intended to be transferred from Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver to the then upcoming Pokemon Black and White, which would have ultimately granted you the TM for Snarl, so nothing really too big was missed out on here, but it was something that for whatever reason was ultimately never distributed. There were also plans within Pokemon Black and White 2 for Hilbert and Hilda, the protagonists from Black and White 1, to appear at the Pokemon World Tournament. They ultimately never appeared anywhere in the game, which personally I think is a huge shame, so it would have been awesome to see them appear in the World Tournament, so it's a shame they didn't get to appear there either. Now we get into Generation 6, and according to an interview with once again Junichi Masuda, he revealed that he actually wanted to include a Pokemon translator in Pokemon X and Y, so you could literally understand what your Pokemon were saying. However, this idea was ultimately scrapped when it was realized just how much text would have to be put into the game in order to make it happen. There is also unused data within the Gen 6 games that reveals an item known as the Travel Trunk, and according to its description, would have allowed you to change your outfit anywhere within the world instead of like in the final game where you only can change your outfit within a Pokemon Center. This would have been really, really convenient, so I don't know why this was changed, but it was changed nevertheless. And now we're into Generation 7, and within the data of the Sun and Moon games, there is evidence that Pokemon Go connectivity was originally planned. We ultimately did not end up seeing this until Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee in the later parts of Generation 7, but it's interesting to know that it was planned as early as Sun and Moon. A mysterious thing about the Gen 7 games is that originally it seemed like there was going to be some kind of vehicle implementation in them, as various pieces of concept art show a specific emphasis on the use of vehicles. At the end of the day, the only vehicle that made it into the games though was a standard pickup truck, and it ultimately served no other function than just being decorative. A feature for Sun and Moon that was cut that was definitely going to be in the games, however, was following Pokemon, as walking and running animations for every single Pokemon was found within the data of Sun and Moon. If I had to guess, this was probably cut due to the fact that adding another walking model onto the screen probably would have been too much for the 3DS to handle, since Sun and Moon were already kind of pushing it to the limit. There is also a ton of evidence within the Sun and Moon games that Pokemon Human Fusion was going to be a thing. It's honestly everywhere. I don't have time to cover it in this video, so go check out this theory video that I made all about the subject. Honestly, your mind will be blown, because there's a ton of evidence in support of it.
And now, finally, we get to Generation 8, the current generation as of the making of this video. Within the data of Sword and Shield specifically, there is an image of a girl Rotom Dex that goes entirely unused within the game, bringing up questions as to whether this was going to be intended for the female player character as an alternative to the standard Rotom. A really interesting cut feature from Pokemon Sword and Shield is one that was revealed within the leaked beta of the game. On the summary screen where you go to save your game, it was revealed via this beta that there was originally a trainer rank stat that came complete with an experience bar. This did not appear in the final game, but if I personally had to guess, given the emphasis on the Galar League as a competitive type of thing, it could have possibly been intended for the game to have a rank system like we see in the Pokemon Journeys anime, which would have been pretty cool. And finally, our 50th and final cut feature from the Pokemon games that I'm going to be talking about here today is a cut battle with Peonia in the Crown Tundra expansion for Pokemon Sword and Shield. Peonia is a character that was introduced specifically within this part of the DLC for Sword and Shield, but in the final game, you do not battle her. However, within the data of this DLC is a battle animation for her that is custom to her specifically, which suggests that originally we were going to battle her at some point within the Crown Tundra expansion. And there you have it, a whopping 50 features that were cut from the Pokemon games that could have changed everything. Which of these do you wish would have actually made it into the games? Let me know in the comments and be sure to leave a like if you enjoyed. You can also greatly support the channel by subscribing if you're new for more content, but also by listening to my Pokemon remixes on Spotify and other music streaming services. It helps out a ton with the making of videos right back here and is greatly appreciated. With that said, I'll be back with another video very soon, and until then, as always, I love you guys, thanks so much for watching, and I will smell you guys later.